Ага. So I would like to invite Professor Jake Rice to share with you his knowledge, excitement, and experience. This is the changer. Okay, forward, backward. Do you prefer this or this one? This one. Okay. This is a very intimidating audience to address. I'm used, if I'm in a room with this many people, they're all policymakers waiting for me to say the one thing that supports their preconception or the one thing that will make my whole talk discreditable when they have to go report, oh, he said some things, but they're wrong. Um, I actually have to try to be intelligent for 90 minutes. Please bear with me. Now, oops, maybe this one looks better. Before I get there, after the several really inspiring panelists speaking about different roles that scientists do play or should play, by chance I put on this first slide some of the things in my background. I spent 10 years well, I spent 20 years as a marine scientist publishing papers, doing research, working on assessment problems. My reward for 20 years of loyal service was the punishment of being made director of science advice for the Ministry of Fisheries and Oceans. And I spent a decade trying to get groups of scientists together to do the peer review provide consensus advice on whatever it was the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans of Canada was dealing with from time to time. That earned me the further punishment of being promoted to chief scientist for the ministry for another 10 years. All that time primarily spent supporting our international affairs and foreign affairs department in international meetings. So I've been a scientist, I've got my 250 publications, papers in science and nature and two books, and then 20 years of trying to apply science directly to policy makers. And that has led me to be unable to move this thing. <laughs> Maybe this one, yes. Faced with the challenge of saying, what is the international policy agenda for the ocean? I couldn't do that in 90 days, let alone 90 minutes. So what I've decided to do is take a couple of issues that are certainly on the forefront of global policy and try to explain why issues whose solutions may appear straightforward to any one individual who carries into considering the problem one perspective, very quickly become a quagmire of values, perceptions, and history. Um, it's the places where there are multiple viewpoints, which are individually legitimate, that difficult choices have to be made. And then how do you get those issues onto the policy agenda and get out of the policy people something other than a platitude of, yes, we agree, this is a serious problem. Um, that means there are some high-profile policy issues that I won't be talking about. Um, things like plastics in the ocean. It's a hard problem to solve because the solutions are just challenging to implement. But there's no disagreement that it's bad and we wish it wouldn't happen more, and we wish we'd turn the clock back and stop having done it. There's no tough policy choice to be made. There are just hard policy pathways to find. The first one I want to start with is the blue economy. This is a major global policy issue. 
And last year at the World Ocean Conference at the UN in June, um, this was one of the focal discussions for the entire week. The document that was the foundation document for that conference was produced by the World Bank and UN DESA, the Department of Economic Social Affairs, a very reasonable group to be looking at the blue economy, making the ocean more part of an economic solution. Specific, specifically, the blue economy as a way to deal with increasing the sustainability of uses of the ocean and increasing the contribution of ocean-based economies, particularly to small island developing states and to the least developed economies of the planet. This is where that document focused. A pretty easy general goal to line up with. It's hard to be against any component of that. Now, this is captured in SDG targets, the Sustainable Development Goal target 14.7. Increase economic benefits to the SIDS and the LIDS from the sustainable use of marine resources. Pretty explicit in that target for SDG 14. This is what we'd like to do. And the document from the World Bank and DESA to lay the foundation for the dialogue had four pillars to achieve progress on that target. First one, and this is direct quotes from the document, so I don't already distort my message to you by um, paraphrasing it. Yeah, the range of economic sectors different industries, that is, and related policies that together determine whether the use of the ocean resources is sustainable. This is already an important acknowledgement. We're no longer looking at the accountability of an individual sector for its individual footprint on the ocean. It's the collective sustainability of all our uses of the ocean. That's a big step forward already. Next thing the pillars do is seek to promote economic growth, social inclusion, the preservation or improvement of livelihoods, while at the same time ensuring environmental sustainability of the ocean and coastal areas. There's nothing on that list anybody can be against Collectively, if we were to, to deliver that, we probably would have a better planet on which to live. But at the same time, they've paired two quite different things we're trying to do at the same time. And a lot of the, what I'll spend my, the rest of my time on is teasing apart in these policy documents the fact that they've already buried the problem inside the outcome they're trying to achieve. Then it goes on to highlight the fact that the blue economy will have diverse components and that the mix of ocean activities will vary among states. There's no one solution out there we're looking for. It's going to be a mixture of a lot of different uses of the ocean, diverse components, and that mix is going to be very different in different countries, different regions of the world. The document actually acknowledges that each one of those four pillars brings with it um, some challenges that need to be met both in global, regional, national, and subnational policies and actions. One of them is to make sure that collectively the uses of the ocean are sustainable. And to do that, we have to meet the challenge of understanding better and managing better the many aspects of ocean sustainability, fisheries sustainability, pollution, ecosystem health, all those things collectively have to be done better, better understood, better managed. 
to achieve the sustainability dimension of this blue economy. And then sustainable management of ocean um, resources requires collaboration across nation states, so you actually have to work together around shared basins, collaboration better, management better, among the different industry sectors. They have to start taking each other's interests and footprints better into account. And on scales that have not previously been achieved. So those are the little challenges of one of the four pillars. Moving to that second pillar, growth, inclusion, livelihoods, but protection of the oceans. Focused on livelihoods is good. <clears throat> it's not just focused on generating wealth. It's focused on supporting livelihoods of people. But it means confronting the decoupling of social and economic development um, through ocean-related sectors from environmental and ecosystem degradation. It's easy to increase socioeconomic development if you're willing to tolerate environmental degradation. The challenge is finding a way to decouple the degradation from the development, get the development, leave the degradation as a legacy of the past to be remediated but not repeated. The third pillar, that diverse components, this means there's a mix of traditional established uses of the ocean already. Fisheries has a long history in every part of the ocean. Tourism in various forms in many parts of the coastal areas. Maritime transport is another one rarely considered a priori as part of an ocean's agenda, but maritime transport, shipping, the movement of goods on the ocean constitutes, some estimates make, as much as 80% of global trade is maritime trade. And that is so foundational to national economics that this thing that most of us don't think of as part of global ocean policy as a frontline activity is in fact one of the cornerstones that other things are constantly having to accommodate because countries don't compromise on their historical transport patterns and rights. Then we have to add on to those existing activities, many of which are already difficult to conduct sustainably, the new ones that help generate a bluer, and stronger economy. <clears throat> Offshore renewable energy, wind farms, tides and waves, things like that. Aquaculture, which in many parts of the world on maritime scales is a relatively new activity. Seabed mining in areas and types of seabed resources not done in the past. And the whole quite new field of marine biotechnology and all the opportunities and all the real risks and challenges associated with sustainable biotech. So those are the diverse component challenges. Then the point about the mix varying um, by country. Nobody can dispute that, but um, Oh, I missed an important one in P3, that little line at the end. Several of the really important things about the contribution of the ocean to people's well-being, people's livelihoods, are not monetized. And many people say if it's not monetized, it's not part of economy. It's not part of the blue economy if it's cultural and aesthetic. And that decoupling of human satisfaction and how you feel about things from, oh, it's not economic because we can't attach a value to, value 
to your cultural identity becomes an interesting challenge to address in a blue economy. The mix varying by country, the providing social and economic benefits for coastal and future generations. Yeah, nobody can be against it, but does it need to be said? Um, restore, protect, maintain diverse productivity, resilience, functions, and intrinsic value of marine ecosystems. I had thought I'd been working on that for 40 years and still didn't know how to do it. And now it's just one of about a, two dozen challenges that this new blue economy has to face. And then how it's faced, clean technologies, renewable energy, circular uh, material flows. That's a very sophisticated way to say, don't waste as much and recycle more. So circular material flows is your sophisticated term for the day. How are we going to make all this happen? They've got that all figured out. Support it by a trusted, diversified knowledge base. This could be a 90-minute talk in itself. Diversified knowledge base, and that means not just all the disciplines of science working together. That means bringing in the knowledge of local coastal communities, the knowledge of indigenous peoples. Local communities have centuries of living in harmony with their oceans and sometimes contaminating them very badly. Indigenous cultures, not centuries, but millennia. Many successful, some not successful. But bringing these knowledge systems all together, complementing them with human resources, that inspire and support innovation. That's you guys. You're the ones who are supposed to inspire and support innovation. We have to tell you how to do it when we haven't been able to. Um, anticipate, incorporate the impacts of climate change. If the problem wasn't hard enough before, this sentence just made it even more realistic on one hand, because climate change is a reality and has to be part of any planning for the future. And it's another thing that has been extremely difficult to even figure out how to do, and then even more difficult to get into the policy agenda and get out activist solutions to it. Low carbon, resource efficient pathways, etc. And the fact that small island states, low income developing states, lack the capacity is included in this overall UN DESA World Bank view. So they acknowledge the need for it. They acknowledge there are some short term priority concerns. Overcoming economic trends that are rapidly degrading ocean resources doesn't mean stop using the resources. It does mean stop activities that use them in ways that degrade them. Invest in human capital required to harness employment and the development benefits that we can get from attracting investment if you have a knowledgeable body of people ready to take action with the investments. And that's an important priority to get right. Strengthening the concepts and overcoming inadequate valuation of marine resources. I gather that through this course, there are going to be a couple of sessions just on this issue of the valuation of marine resources. The valuation of terrestrial resources is only a very recent thing, but it has totally changed the dialogue terrestrially, as I found out co-chairing the IP best um, regional assessment for the Americas. The valuation brings new risks, but without it, there are whole dialogues that are very hard to hold. And then governance of isolated sectoral management. We'll hear a great deal of this, I'm sure, for the rest of this week while I'm here next week as well. Sectoral management 
is embedded in ocean governance. People forget sectoral management is totally the norm for terrestrial governance as well. There aren't new problems presented by the fact that ocean governance is sectoral, but making sectoral governance work is tough, and it took a century to figure out how to do it on land. And the lack of capacity to manage sectors to implement the provisions that exist in UNCLOSE. There's a long session, section in that report on how to go from small island developing states and low income developing states transitioning to better status. And I can't, in the time I have, begin to summarize all the things. If this is an area where you're interested in working, that part of that report is important to read. And here are some terms that I pulled out as ones that you really have to understand and know what they mean in dialogue. The integration of sectoral planning is on that list. Evidence-based decision-making. Comforting to all of you who are scientists thinking of working in careers which inform decision-making and policy. Evidence-based decision-making is growing as an interim to use. Making it real is not straightforward, but getting it acknowledged as the basis for what we want is important. And I'll talk on that in my second lecture later in the day. Ecosystem-based management, sectoral management, spatial planning, balance, all those things. They do spend time in that report on the fact that there's a need for national plans for the blue economies because economic planning, there's a very important dimension of it that is done at the national scale. And I've pulled off just some of the many things in that section that are real highlights to pay attention to if you're trying to build up your knowledge of the blue economy as part of marine ocean policy and your role as science advisors in support of it. National plans that actually balance growth with sustainability to get optimal use, maximum benefits to your peoples, or at least the minimum harm. Development plans and policies, not just who can get there first and move the fastest, but actually planned growth so that some sectors don't outstrip others and in the process cut off avenues that might actually support more livelihoods in more sustainable ways. There's an important proviso in there about the provisions of these national plans need to be nested within UNCLOS, within the Convention on the Law of the Sea. That's important because if they're not nested in the provisions of UNCLOSE, your country might not even have the right to do it on a global scale. Other countries not, might not acknowledge your right to exclude their access to certain things, your right to conduct your business in particular ways, if it's not consistent with these issues of sovereignty as they're defined within UNCLOS. And they make an interesting point that every component of a national plan has to have at least two of four elements, and when possible, all four, of reducing food loss and generally waste in the value chain. Food security is going to be really important in these national plans. Energy efficiency has to be a part of your national plans. Decent employment, not just lots and lots of employment, but decent employment. Employment that brings satisfaction and dig dignity, equity by gender, by culture and community. Decent employment and innovative financing and technology. 
particularly the small island states, least developed states, can't do this without help. There are sections in that report on every single one of these industry sectors. I won't pretend to summarize them, but this is how comprehensive the World Bank and DESA tried to be in providing guidance on what the blue economy really needs. Providing guidance on what kinds of activities have to go on. And many of these fall to those of you who are scientists to be crucial in providing. Monitoring surveillance, taking an ecosystem approach conceptually and operationally in each of these activities. Then integrating those ecosystem approaches across the different industry sectors. So they're all trying to deliver the same outcomes, not different ones with regard to environmental status, which means ecosystem assessments, spatial management where it's necessary, including but not exclusively marine protected areas, carbon capture, as a consideration in all your habitat uses, and particularly habitat rehabilitation. The ocean, 70% of the Earth's surface, has to be part of the solution to mitigating carbon emissions and climate change, and financial mechanisms. When we think of that package, I'm impressed by it. Broad scale thinking, they covered off most of the bases. I don't pretend to say any of it was easy, but it looked like a really good package. But that's one perspective on what the blue economy is. Almost synchronous to within just six weeks, the European Union, commission, the commission at Brussels, produced a staff report on the blue growth strategy towards sustainable growth and jobs in the blue economy. Exactly the same thing, but this time from a developed world perspective. Let's look at what, from the developed world perspective, the blue economy is. And they talk about within the European Union, and I picked them as a whipping boy, not because Canada, the US, Japan, the other developed economies are any different, but they were the ones that put the package together on paper so you can pull it out and look at it and examine it. This is not selectively saying the EU has it uniquely in this perspective. There's already 5 million jobs in the blue economy of the European Union, generating 5 billion, 500 billion euros per year of wealth already. And 99% of those jobs were in living resources, which is code for fishing, non-living resources, code for aggregate and sand mining and things like that, transportation, shipbuilding, tourism. The blue economy growth areas were going to be energy, aquaculture, much more in different tourism, uh, biotech, and deep sea seabed mining. So that by, and as an example, between 2010 and 2016, there were already 150,000 new jobs, I dropped a zero off typing, my apologies, 150,000 new jobs in renewable energy, offshore wind farms, early versions of wave and tidal power. And by 2030, the total global value of $2.6 trillion for ocean industries, up from half a trillion dollars, 500 billion. So that's a five-fold growth by 2030 in economic wealth generated by the ocean. What's the view from the developed world of the environment and the knowledge needs for blue growth. C environmentally, the concerns, CO2 emissions, efficiency of resource uses, the size and the nature of the footprint of the industry sectors. That's pretty common 
between these two perspectives. The report highlights there's already considerable support from EU resource, research and EU investment programs. Not a matter of we need capacity building, we need innovative financial measure, mechanisms. They're saying there's already substantial research, substantial financing already being drawn from on a day-to-day -day basis. The blue growth does not rely on regulation, but on enabling market forces to support development. This is a dramatically different perspective than the World Bank DESA perspective on how blue growth is going to be achieved, the blue economy is going to be achieved. Market incentives, market forces, not regulation to bring about development and sustainability. And in 2014 to 2016, a total of 800 million euros have already been devoted to more research and development. This is innovative financing at its best. The action so far, renewing the common fisheries policy developing a trans-European transportation network. This is the shipping issue again, really coordinating increased energy efficiency, less pollution from shipping, including less noise pollution. All these things are in way. Mobilize, seeking to address emissions from the transport sector, and a, Ocean Energy Forum, looking for public-private partnerships to develop these clean energy, renewable energy resources, and highlighting that offshore wind power is the fastest growing activity of the entire blue economy already. And we can see <coughs> Twelve thousand megawatts of capacity already. The investment bank has financed a grid to integrate this power source across northwestern Europe already. Currents and tides. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see the magnitude of the investment that's already being made in these new sources of energy development and another 140 million euros by 2020 on the horizon. Enablers, open access to marine data as foundation. And they've got projects like Copern, Copern, Copern you can read it off the screen. <laughs> um, they've got data collection frameworks, observatories, data networks, all this already being built and supported. Enablers in terms of really organized, scientifically well-supported marine spatial planning. The Marine Strategy Framework Directive, as far back as 2008, a full decade ago, the MSFD became European policy as a framework directive for economic development and sustainability of uses of the ocean. Um, they set back then the standard to achieve good environmental status for all the coastal seas of the entire European Union. And they invested a very large amount in developing the science foundations for each component. And I believe there were, what, eight or 12, Salvatore? You'd know. Uh, how, the different components of good environmental status under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. I co-chaired some of their work on component six, which was seafloor integrity, but there were quite a few others. And that took 18 months of a team of 20 experts working just on that one little component of it. Six year cycle didn't even fully resolve the definitions 
let alone identified the list of indicators and the thresholds on the indicators to deliver good environmental status. There's a whole table of funding that you probably can't read for at least half the room, so I won't spend time on it. But all I can tell you is those are big numbers being spent to implement this. This is where the EU envisions going. But what's happening? And employment in Chapter 5 of that report. What's happened to employment and fishing with a common fisheries policy? What's happened to employment and shipbuilding with the, review, with the new maritime transport mechanism? Aquaculture stable, shipping and trade. This again, this is a different vision than DESA had. It's still the blue economy, but it's clear here they're willing to see employment in these traditional activities drop, in the case of fishing and in case of shipbuilding, drop a lot in exchange for better environmental sustainability, which they are definitely getting, cleaner energy, which they're definitely getting, and much greater economic wealth, which they're definitely getting. They traded off livelihoods for it, something that in the EU, in the um, SIDS and LIDS um, vision of the blue economy, sustainable livelihoods and more livelihoods was foundational to everything else. So these are some things that need to be discussed in our breakout sessions among the groups. Yeah. From the most developed states on the planet, the EU, for example, to the least developed states, they all have the blue economy as one of their foundational policy goals and agendas. Is it the same in these different perspectives? Do they think the same things are needed to make it happen? How big will the benefits be and what kind of benefits will they be? Will it be greater wealth, greater livelihoods, more livelihoods, greater environmental sustainability? Where will they happen? How will they be distributed planetarily? These are important questions that you'll talk about and solve by the end of next week. I'm going to move on to another issue that came up this morning, this issue of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And by the way, I don't have a clock in front of me and my Blackberry stopped, so it's not telling me how long I've taken. So when I've done about three quarters of my time, somebody should start waving their hands because I can probably go on until tomorrow morning before I need to take a breath. Um, but this biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction has been another really major policy agenda for over a decade. The core issue, unclose, as was pointed out, is the constitution of the ocean. That's how it's referred to. And it's got a lot of really important provisions made by really wise men and women. In those days, it was predominantly men. Um, it, the shortcomings are undoubtedly because of that. But uh, in ne nevertheless, they did a pretty good job for being turned loose on their own. Um, <clears throat> It established legally marine jurisdiction out to 200 miles. Why was it 200 nautical miles? That's a strange boundary to draw. I know the answer, but you have to buy me a beer to get it. Um, it differentiated the legal regime of the water column from the legal regime of the seabed, or the area as it's called. It entrenched rights of innocent passage, enabling you to deal with piracy, um, illegal activities in the ocean, and it empowered sectoral management through authorizing intergovernmental organizations like um, fi regional fisheries management organizations and regional fisheries management bodies to actually act legally on the high seas. 
Those were pretty important things because they didn't exist before. But many considered that it was incomplete. Some of the incomplete components of it immediately began to be addressed. One of them to deal with seabed mining, and the seabed mining agreement came around within about 15 years. And it came up with issues about cost sharing, how decision making from mining the deep sea floor would be done, created some institutions. The, fic, the fish stocks agreement right behind it, and it dealt with highly migratory stocks that didn't stay in one country's jurisdiction, but went back and forth across them, empowered fi regional fisheries management bodies with more authority, greatly increased the duty of states which share fish stocks to cooperate in their sustainable management, um, and greatly in here increased the coherence and the compatibility of measures being taken by different states to achieve sustainable fisheries in the high seas. But the area of explicitly biodiversity conservation as an outcome of its own, not as an outcome of sectoral management, which is keeping shipping sustainable, keeping mining sustainable, keeping fisheries sustainable. Conserving biodiversity doesn't belong to a sector. It's only influenced by sectors. There's no clarity in UNCLOS or the implementing agreements on whether or not marine genetic resources are to be governed under freedom of the seas or the common heritage of mankind. And that's a hugely different inter, um, legal regime in which to approach them. There's no mechanism to distribute benefits of developing and commercializing marine genetic resources if there is any responsibility to distribute the benefits. There's a lack of criteria for how area-based management measures are to be identified as necessary and implemented if desired. There's no explicit legal basis, implicit some people argue, but no explicit legal basis or no mechanisms that actually establish area-based conservation measures, which may be marine protected areas on the high seas, may be other area-based measures but there's no mechanism to create them and regulate them. And if you've got intergovernmental organizations, whether it's shipping, mining, regional fisheries management organizations, they can adopt binding regulations, but only binding on parties to the intergovernmental organization. Other countries are not necessarily bound by them. There are provisions in UNCLOSE about duties cooperate that can be interpreted in various ways. But it was considered not explicit enough. And again, no mechanism to ensure coherence of sectoral management. And I put in here two or three slides just to highlight, these are not problems UNCLOSE was unaware of or chose to ignore. They're right in the preamble of UNCLOS, it says, conscious of the problems of ocean space are interrelated, need to be considered as a whole. For the 1970s, that's a pretty forceful and important statement to have already entrenched in the constitution of the ocean. And the equitable and efficient utilization of their resources they acknowledge that far back the issue of equity, the issue of efficiency, was supposed to be crucial to how we use the ocean. And the study, protection, preservation of the marine environment, those are all right in the preamble already. And the overarching goals are given. And these are just some extracts from UNCLOS that are really relevant to this discussion. Best scientific evidence 
is in the convention. Proper conservation and management measures is in the convention. And living resources are not to be endangered by over-exploitation. States shall cooperate. These things are all in the convention already. Such measures should be designed to maintain or restore populations up to the maximum, the biodiversity needed for maximum sustainable yield of fisheries. Um, needs of coastal fishing communities and the special requirements of developing states are in the parts of, the, of UNCLOSE on coastal fisheries and fish stocks. There's provisions about general, general biodiversity already in UNCLOSE. Carryover of provisions from Article 64 in part three on the high seas when you're outside national jurisdiction. Subject to conviction, it says quite clearly, freedom of fishing on the high seas is subject to all the conviction conditions laid down in section three, section two. You don't have license to overfish in the high seas, even if there's no body to regulate you. You're not under the convention, if you're a signatory, you've agreed you're going to regulate your own vessels individually not to do that. And the states have a duty to cooperate with other states in taking the measures that are needed is in there. Now, the UN General Assembly acknowledging that implementation of some of these components left a little bit to be desired. They began um, to take measures specifically to protect biodiversity. In the 55th sitting of UNGA, back in 2002, was it? I can't remember. It banned high seas drift net fitting, fishing categorically because of all of its detrimental biodiversity impacts. Annual sustainability, annual resolutions, all about sustainable fisheries. It went on for well over 100 paragraphs of guidance on how to make fisheries more sustainable, um, including very specific requirements to prevent damage to the seafloor in the high seas. And if you couldn't do it, you couldn't allow those fisheries to proceed. These were all in there. And FAO provided a lot of guidance documents on fisheries. And I'm focusing on fisheries because it's such a concrete example with such a rich policy framework to present to you. It's not that other uses aren't important, but this is just so well documented for people who are developing um, scientists supporting policy. Um, the FAO alone produced this long list of technical guidance on how to do all those things to make fisheries sustainable, to make the footprint of fisheries on the ecosystem within sustainable bounds so it didn't degrade the ecosystems being fished. It has precautionary approach. That goes back to 1995 and 1996. Integrated management of fisheries before the 2000s. Sustainable development of fisheries before the 2000s. All this guidance already exists. And because of that, there were many parties to unclose which said, we don't need another agreement, another annex to unclose. All that guidance is there. We need to act on the things we've already agreed should be done, and we have guidance in how to do them. We don't need more policy. We need more action on policies that already exist. 
Nevertheless, 2004. And what's special about 2004? Somebody? It's right after the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment came out. You shouldn't lose that connection. The MEA was crucial in triggering some of these things like calling at the UN level for an odd hoke, open-ended, informal working group. And anybody who's ever been to one of these odd hoke, informal, odd hoke, open-ended, informal working groups can agree, it's odd hoke, it's open-ended because it never ends. The only thing it isn't is informal. Everybody's in suits, everybody speaks according to UN rules. But nevertheless, they created an odd hoke, open-ended, informal working group to study issues related to conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. It took nine meetings over 10 years of these ad hoc informal discussions, ad hoc open-ended informal discussions, to um, exchange views on the core parameters and the feasibility of whether an instrument is needed or not. Um, to and the product of that was a decision to establish a committee after nine meetings in 10 years, they were able to decide to establish a committee to um, make substantive recommendations to the General Assembly on the elements of a draft text of an internationally, international legally binding agreement. So a committee to decide what the legally binding instrument would be allowed to even discuss. Whoops. Yeah. The two PREPCOM meetings in 2016 and 17 agreed on a charge to create a new legally binding instrument for the entire high seas to deal with biodiversity. It must agree on, it must address all three parts of the package. This is some, uh, this is a phrase you need to master if you're going to be taken seriously as talking about ocean policy. You have to be able to drop the word, oh, the package, on a regular basis. Um, access and benefits sharing to marine genetic, re from commercial uses of marine genetic resources. It had to resolve that issue. It had to create mechanisms to implement area-based management tools including but not exclusively marine protected areas. And it had to come up with parameters for doing environmental impact assessments, sector by sector and cross sectoral that would be considered credible as a starting point for sectoral and cross sectoral management. All three pretty progressive things dealing with issues that had been hard and divisive for a long time. And then they we're careful to put in afterwards that whatever this new instrument should contain, the text should not undermine the existing legal instruments and frameworks and relevant global, regional, and sectoral bodies. So it had to build on the status quo. It couldn't go back and retool it if it was built wrong. So this is where BBNJ has taken us. And it's going to be hard to get this next step done. And in a book that Serge Garcia, Tony Charles, who will be speaking to you next week, and I co-edited, Laurie Ridgway, who was a Canadian policy negotiator in marine affairs for a long time, wrote a chapter specifically on international instruments in the governance of biodiversity and fisheries. And she highlights the fact that government's institutions re exist primarily to resolve conflicting interests in the use or preservation of environmental resources. This is environmental governance institutions. If there's no controversies, if there's no disagreements, you could argue you don't need a lot of governance. Um, exclude unauthorized resource uses. 
affirm who's entitled to what. This is what governance has to do. How benefits will be shared. Um, what kind of monitoring and enforcement is necessary? Who pays for it? Who does it? Who interprets it? And then resolving the case-by-case -case conflicts. Um, because this is, these are some of the things government governance has to do to be effective in areas like the high seas, this necessarily makes the role distribution of power in resolving conflicts, it brings in distribu distributive and procedural justice concepts directly into environmental decision making. And this is, this is why these things are important, because you can't make environmental decisions without dealing with distributive justice, procedural justice. Who wins, who loses, who has what kind of voice. This is not going to be an easy resolve issue to resolve. Sectoral intergovernmental organizations, many of them as was pointed out this morning, there cannot be activists in their own right. They only work for the will of their parties. But parties to sectoral IGOs argue the intergovernmental organizations, sector by sector, can achieve all the coherence we need without a new body. Because these sectoral IGOs, just by their very existence, already have legitimacy to make decisions and manage and do all the things that governance needs done. And there's a list of reasons that I've pulled out here for why existing sectoral IGOs, the parties to them argue they're good enough. They may have to tweak their procedures and stuff like that, but rather than create yet more governance, which not yet has demonstrated, if I can go back, um, yeah, not demonstrated an, a body, a new body can do this long list of things, because these are not simple things to resolve. Take the existing sectoral measure, intergovernmental organizations, and just make them work a little better. Sector, all these sectors have made a lot of progress already, build on it, don't tear it apart and replace it. This is why those la that language about it has to not, I forget exactly what the words are, but it can't replace or degrade existing sectors, has to build on them. But there are voices that argue a new body is essential. From my perspective, as a science advisor, first to the Canadian government, and in the latter days, directly to Dualos on this, um, there are new actors who want a place at the table. Environmental groups, the landscape of how environmental dialogue occurs has changed since UNCLOSE and the two implementing agreements in the 90s. It's a different landscape of players, and people, some voices feel disenfranchised because they weren't at the table when the previous rules were created. They argue that the sum of the scope, if you take the mandate for each intergovernmental organization, combine them, the sum of the scope of all the organizations when put together isn't enough to conserve biodiversity. And it has some big redundancies, so it has lots of opportunity to be at least inefficient, if not antagonistic, between sectors. It argues that measures whose only purpose is to preserve biodiversity will not be in the mandate of any sectoral intergovernmental organization to begin with. CITES has a mandate to protect biodiversity, but only after a species is endangered. Until it is on a CITES annex, CITES doesn't have the authority to take action to protect it. 
Um, some intergovernmental organizations don't even have or don't have a clear and explicit mandate to use some of the best tools to preserve and protect biodiversity. And this is a gap that they argue needs to be filled. And the types of compromises that intergovernmental organizations on a sectoral basis would have to make to achieve greater coherence in the collective outcome of their measures may in fact be argued as lowering their ability to, de to deliver some of their core responsibilities that were given to them when the intergovernmental organizations were created. These are complex problems in the reality. So what do we expect? These are some questions, again, that you need to talk about over the next two weeks and then come back to those of us who have in, caught in this quagmire with how we're going to get out of it. Yeah. Is the package really a package? Personally, I've never seen those three issues as ecologically integrated. They're a trade-off of different policy goals of different sets of countries. And the way that they got the three of them addressed was for each one to say, we won't address your problem unless you address ours. They're not a package in anything except they all have the same wrapping paper. Um, will the conservation biology interests and voices ever trust sectoral intergovernmental organizations enough to trust them to conserve biodiversity? That's a question that I have my own views on, and you should come to yours. But this issue of trust is fundamental to delivering outcomes. And if we do have another body created, which does have exclusively a conservation mandate, should it be an extension of the existing Convention on Biological Diversity, which has a lot of biodiversity-related provisions and powers in the convention, and a whole set of implementation processes, structures, procedures, and institutions to deliver them, or should it be a separate body? These are interesting questions to discuss. Now, with what time I have left, anybody tell me how much? I can't see that at all. What, 13? 30 or 13? 13. Okay. I'll give you a much more concrete example of how these things can play out in a real concrete global policy challenge. And it's one that I've been quite involved with for about a decade. And it's the nexus where in the ocean, fisheries for sustainability meeting global food security needs and climate change all come together. Whoops. Because these discussions pairwise are going on all kinds of places. Climate change and food security, you can Google up dozens of reports on that. Climate change and biodiversity conservation, climate change and fisheries, climate change and food security, putting the three of them together. Each pairwise combination, you can see clear pathways to make progress. The three together, it becomes a much bleaker picture. And I've got here, and you can download this, I won't read them. These are some key sources that I've used in the slides that follow. Human population growth and food security needs. Everybody's seen that figure or one like it. The calories, they're met by grains and vegetables. Everywhere in the globe, this is where people get the calories they need to survive. Protein is the limiting factor for many communities and many desires of getting healthy down. One and a half billion people get at least 
of their, their non-grain protein. For, and by non-grain protein, it's not something special. By the time they've got the calories they need from eating grains and vegetables, they've got protein, but they haven't got enough. So the protein deficit after they've met their caloric need, 20% or more of that comes from fish. In poor island states, many coastal states of low income, it's more than 50% of the non-grain protein, plus all the micronutrients and stuff. And we estimated back in 2010, 3.65 times 10 to the 8 tons of dietary protein would be needed, incremental to what we're taking now from the ocean, just to meet population growth needs. But you can plot figures of this, and this comes from one of the APEC reports. If it weren't for climate change, we could probably keep up with the need for protein and food security. But the climate change slide from grains and existing sources, if you add climate change, by around 2030, we will be in a deficit position. We will sh fall short of meeting Compared to now, where there is already a lot of hunger and malnutrition, this is taking 2015 as the norm, as if 2015 everything were fine. Serious deficits, and what can we do with fishing? From the FAO reports of, sustain, of where we're getting fish from, the orange part here is protein from capture fisheries, the blue part is protein from aquaculture. Capture fisheries has been stable since the 1990s. Aquaculture has been growing exponentially. They're stable at 85 to 90 million metric tons of food, and that can be delivered sustainably. We know how to do it, we're making progress. Aquaculture is now up to around 60, 70 million metric tons, and you can see how much it's increasing. We'll need another 70 million metric tons of, of sea-based protein by 2050 to make up for that. Um, population growth plus climate change impact. So that's as much more aquaculture production, or about 80% of the total capture fisheries we're getting now, within another 30 years. You can't get it from capture fisheries unless we fundamentally change how we conduct fisheries. As I said, 90 million tons can be sustainable, but not much more than that. And I, there's evidence here of why the night, a lot of people say, oh, fisheries are continuing to go to hell. That's not true. Everywhere in the world that there are the resources to invest in science-based stock assessments and the resources to invest in actually managing fishing activity on the high seas, the very large majority of fish stocks are exploited at or below a sustainable rate, and the biomass of those fish stocks is recovering. We haven't made ground back from everything we lost in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But everywhere in the world that you invest in assessing and managing fisheries, 90% of those stocks are being managed well and recovering or sustainable. Everywhere in the world that they're not investing in assessments and management, they are continuing to go down. It's not because we don't know how to manage fisheries. It's because we don't have the resources in much of the world to do it. And that's an important message to take away. Aquaculture, I'm going to skip over this quickly because I don't have much time left. The message here is the period when aquaculture was associated with really serious detrimental environmental impacts is also history 
for the parts of the world where there are the resources to actually manage aquaculture. The chemical contamination from overfeeding them, from giving them too many antibiotics and growth hormones and stuff. We've learned the lessons. We know how to make aquaculture sustainable. But again, we have to invest in doing it. We know what the ecosystem effects of fishing are. We've been working on these things since the 1980s. That's what got me out of terrestrial ecology into marine research to work specifically on quantifying what they were, identifying pathways to address them. And we largely know how to do it. IQ Biodiversity Target 6 has targets for all the things that fisheries can do to biodiversity. Bycatches, seabed impacts, endangered species, ecosystem structure and function, and the guidance in how to achieve those targets exists in papers that have recently been produced jointly by the CBD and FAO, the type of collaboration we've been talking about. Ecosystem effects of aquaculture, known and manageable. But when we put that picture of what we need for, for food security, together with a picture of what we need for biodiversity conservation, if we want to increase protein to meet the food security needs through increasing harvests, food security says we have to push everything up to the maximum sustainable, not exceed it, because then in the medium term you use yield. Use, you lose yield, not you use yield. You lose yield. And biodiversity conservation has good reasons to stay well below maximum sustainable Fs. Food security needs, definitely, if we're going to produce more protein from the sea, it has to be fishing the lower trophic levels of the ecosystem much harder than we do at present. We leave a lot of that protein in the sea. Fish less is clearly the biodiversity conservation preference. If we're going to fish, fish the high productivity areas because you get the maximum catch per unit of energy used to catch the fish, minimizing carbon emissions to get the highest amount of yield. It's a high productivity, high biodiversity areas the biodiversity wants to conserve the most. All those things are in direct conflict. Mariculture, the same kinds of conflicts are encountered. When you put those three different problems you're trying to achieve together, improve food security, make fisheries more sustainable, and improve biodiversity conservation. Now, I'm going to very quickly show you two slides from this and then give you a break from listening to me drone on. The issue is where we are fishing more, producing yield, producing aquaculture, are we trying to contribute to food security? And food is the most, I mean, fish is the most traded food commodity on the planet. And these are showing who's getting most of the fish. It's not going to the food insecure parts of the country. Um, no, this is the regional consumption picture. And that black line going off the graph in the upper right is Southeast Asia. This is where the food is needed for consumption. <clears throat> this is where they're fishing. And the discrepancies between these lines are showing they're where the fishing is, fishing is increasing the most, where the food is, fish is being consumed the most, but the majority of the fish they're catching 
is being exported to Europe and North America for profit. They're fishing for dollars to invest in terrestrial problems. And they're using marine fish and aquaculture as the currency to generate revenue from the West to invest in infrastructure and other local problems. So the net um, outcome of this trade is that lower figure, showing how, in fact, the portion of the fish being caught in the most food secure, fish dependent parts of the world going to the people there is rapidly going down as more and more of it is going to North America and Western Europe where those of us who are overweight already are beginning to realize if we ate more fish, less beef and poultry, we'd probably be healthier. Now I'll stop there because climate change is another component of this discussion. And you can see the statistics. It's already reduced global maize corn production 4% in the 10 years between 20, 2005 2015. Wheat has been reduced globally 5% because of changes in temperature regime and waterfall, uh, rainfall, that's making marginally productive areas unproductive. The most productive areas of the world are actually increasing per hectare production through irrigation and controls, but all the marginal areas are being abandoned due to climate change, and it's leading to a decrease in production. This is increased, forecast to increase a lot, and you can see how much from those numbers. Those are frighteningly large numbers for what could be happening to wheat and maize production on the planet. And fisheries is going to have to deal with those kinds of problems as well. So with that, I think my time is about up for the first part. Yes. And this is a good place to break in this talk. So okay. you're free. Unless you. Thank you, Jay. Uh, we have a break now. Uh, there's coffee, cakes, and gnocchi. No, gnocchi no. <laughs>